Hey everybody, it's Damien Gergiev from The Breaking Down Show and today's guest is David Petrusha. David Petrusha is an American author and historian. David has produced a number of critically acclaimed works concerning 20th century American history, including four volumes, 1920, 1960, 1948, and 1932 on presidential electoral history. Today on the show, he talks about his latest book, 1920, the year of the six presidents. The presidential election of 1920 was one of the most dramatic ever. For the only time in the nation's history, six once and future presidents hope to end up in the White House. If you want to support the Breakdown Show, go to breakdownshow.com and donate to the PayPal link. Also, you can subscribe to any podcast platform and you can watch our videos for free on YouTube. You can get David's books on Amazon, of course. And don't forget to donate to our veteran friends at SaveTheBrave, SaveTheBrave.org. All right, enough of me. Here comes David Petrusha. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. Is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. <laughs> This is David Petru David Petrusha, and I'm mispronouncing my own name. But you're watching. It's not the easiest name. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm sort of used to it. And you're watching the Break It Down Show. And now the Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. <laughs> Seriously. I had to get my dog into the house because she was barking at the neighbor. Uh, my gear is not working right today. Who knows why? Uh, but either way, I've got Josiah with me here, and we got David. David is a fantastic author. He's written a zillion books about what I, I guess I would say um, mid mid twentieth century is what you focus on, and you know, going from like I don't know maybe the teens all the way into almost modern times. What, how would you characterize your era of time that you write about? Because you're clearly fascinated by certain characters and time frames. Yeah, I mean the the earliest stuff I've done in 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 my current iteration of 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 what passes for a career is is Theodore Roosevelt and getting into the World War 1 era era what leads up to that and then taking it into as as far as 1960 and I've dabbled with maybe going into 1964 as well but but I've drawn back for that from a variety of reasons and I think the earlier, the better, uh, the twenties, the thirties, the teens. And, and, and that's sort of my sweet spot is uh, to use an old baseball phrase. Yeah. Well, do you want me to come in here? Peter? Yes. Yeah. 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 So, uh, I was curious cause you know, you, you have done a, a bunch of books on, presidential elections right and i think i think it was 1920 was the first one 1920 was, was the first yeah yeah and then there's also uh 32 48 60 all, all sorts of years but why so i mean we've had a bunch of uh elections i don't know that if you ask most people 1920 would not spring to mind as like a critical year necessarily uh, although, you know, the, as you go into, there's a lot of interesting stuff that happens. So like, what, why, why did you pick 1920? Why, why did you think that that was, you know, such a rich topic? Well, I picked it out for a very flimsy reason on one level, because I, I was looking at, at playing a mental trivia game in my mind. And, and like, so 1960 would have like three presidents or future presidents actively contesting LBJ and Nixon. And, and JFK, and then you you flip over to 1964, and and you've only got LBJ in 68. You get into um, oddly enough Nixon and Reagan, and and that's that's it. You, we tend to forget Reagan was was in play that year. But in any case, three, two, one people. But 1920, then you had six presidents counting TR, who would have been the candidate of the Republicans, who would have one in in a walk and been been returned to the white house as along with wilson harding coolidge hoover 
Franklin Roosevelt, who's on the ticket as, as, as a vice presidential candidate of the Democrats. And so you've got all those people. But even though that original impetus was pretty flimsy, it was building on a very solid ground of all sorts of stuff I had been studying. So when the book finally came together, I realized, wow, all of the uh, stuff I've been studying for decades and accumulating about, say, the League of Nations, the Klan, prohibition, women's suffrage, all of those backstories gave real heft to, uh, to the story of just the election itself. Somebody, I was once at Book Expo in New York City. And I was just wandering around and, and talking to somebody in another booth. And he said, well, what's what book are you most famous for? I said, well, 1920, the year of six presidents. And what's that about? Well, and he goes, you, and I said, well, it's it it's it's in like its 10th paperback printing now. And he says, how did that happen? How did you manage to do 10 printings of a book about the election of Warren Harding? <laughs> and I said, well because it's a pretty good book <laughs> and, and it really it really is a pretty good book and 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 people have, have have ranked it very highly in terms of if not the highest in some cases among among all presidential election books so you know and and it it depends on um you know how it's how it's written and you know i honed my uh skills on writing some early baseball books. And, you know, um, I, I was thinking about that this morning. What was the, what was the, what was the takeaway from that? And the takeaway is you write, you write, you write, you write, and you learn what not to do and how to do it better and, and how to add to the process and make it a more readable experience. Um, so the previous book, and this, this was on the internet, Oh, maybe a, a, a Twitter. Somebody was doing uh, about a week ago on famous first lines of, of books. Yeah. And it reminded me of my previous book, previous to 1920, which was a book on the gangster Arnold Rothstein, of all people. But again, that time frame of the teens and the 20s. And the first line of that, after much trial and error, I put down on the page. And his nickname was, a, among his nicknames, was A.R. And the first line of that book was AR bet he was going to die. So you come in, you come in with a good line, you come in with something that's going to get people's attention. The first line of 1920 is the president of the United States lay bleeding on the bathroom floor. And you grab their attention. And then, of course, you have to keep their attention for about 400 more pages. <laughs> Yes, right. Yeah, yeah. Very, very, very gripping opening. Uh, right. Don't uh, don't think you've got it uh, conquered after that one sentence. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, what what was the president doing on the bathroom? Bloody on the bathroom floor. Uh, he was. He had just had a massive stroke. The president in question is Woodrow Wilson. He's he's already had a bunch of strokes. He had a, a minor stroke before he was president of the United States and was sort of told to. Uh, slow down keep his schedule under uh wraps uh, um and and so he he did not spend a lot of time working uh in the presidency because of that then when he comes back from the league of nations he has something going kablooey in his brains while while at the versailles uh conference comes back to sell the league of nations to the american people in a very uh, grueling tour of the United States. And it's interesting how two presidents of the United States conk out one after another with these big, almost unprecedented Western tours while they're president. Woodrow Wilson has this, well, getting ahead of it, Warren Harding has a big stroke or a heart attack when he is touring the West and Alaska and dies in San Francisco in 1923. But Wilson has his stroke in first one in Pueblo, Colorado, and and really, the tour is cut short on the platform while he's speaking. He's led off the stage. That's bad, folks. But it gets <laughs> worse when he's in the White House, gets up in the middle of the night and has a massive, massive stroke and falls, hits his head on the sink and lies 
bleeding on the black bathroom floor and is really not much of a president after that. And and the question is, who is the president? Is it his wife, uh, his second wife, uh, or is there no president? Is the country leader, le- leaderless, leaderless in a time when we have to convert from a wartime economy, when we have to get ourselves established in international politics with the war- League of Nations, et cetera, et cetera. And while we're still fighting the tail end of of that first big pandemic that we had, the Spanish flu. Yeah, I'm curious, I want to let me go, go ahead. Let me jump in here, Josiah. Yeah. So, and then also we have uh, Coolidge after that, who has a significant uh, death in his family. It's like three presidents in a row where they're waylaid by these deaths. Because I think it's fair to say that Coolidge wasn't the same president after his son dies, too. Is that correct? You get a lot of. You start looking from like Cleveland on. As mm. to what happens with the presidents in the White House, Cleveland has that cancerous growth in his jaw, and he has this uh, a secret operation on a on a boat on the presidential yacht, I think, in the Potomac. Uh, so you you start there, then McKinley comes in, and the first tr- tragedy is not his assassination, but his his wife is a very sickly person, and he has to guard her health. He is assassinated, of course. Things aren't too bad with Theodore Roosevelt. You'd say, well, nothing bad happened there. But he has a boxing match in the White House because he's Theodore Roosevelt, damn it. And it, with a naval young naval officer, and the uh, naval officer pops him in the eye. And he loses his, his eyesight in, in one eye, which is kept a secret from, from the public. Then you go to William Howard Taft, who didn't want to be president. His wife, Nellie, wanted him to be president. but they, they don't get to enjoy it because Nellie Taft has a stroke. And then Woodrow Wilson's first wife dies in his first term. And then what we went into with Wilson and his strokes. Then uh, Harding, Harding, uh, his wife is incapacitated for a good year. Uh, it looks like she's going to die first. Uh, the Duchess, uh, Florence Harding. And um, then Harding dies on that trip to Alaska. So until Hoover, and then of course Hoover doesn't have health problems, so Hoover has other problems. Uh, and and then that that sort of streak ends. But you've got this real streak of of horrible bad health. And if you want to jump from Cleveland back to Arthur, Arthur come Chester Arthur comes down with Bright's disease while he's in the White House and can't run again, is very weakened, and he becomes president because his predecessor, Garfield, has been shot. So it's it's not a job where you want to sell life insurance or health insurance to the occupants. Rothstein wouldn't have written out a lot of policies for these guys. Not on him, no. But uh, Arnold did bet he was going to, what, what that is, what that reference was, that he was also in the insurance he was a legitimate businessman. So he was in real estate. He was in insurance. And, uh, well, one of the things he would w- write insurance policies on is if if you borrowed money from him and he was a big loan shark. So, um, you know, if something happened to you, he'd, he'd collect his money one way or the other. And at that point, he was he was writing a bigger insurance policy on himself uh, on the uh, just before he goes and gets shot. Uh, fatally and and uh, over a bad gambling debt. So uh, uh, that was a bet he won in a way you don't want to win. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it, I guess it's good to be uh, protected at least. Um, I was going to ask about uh, the the League of Nations because, you know, you mentioned that uh, Wilson was, he had his stroke when he was doing his uh, campaign to try and get approval for it, which didn't happen. And I know, you know, I, I mentioned this because I know you later wrote a book. Well, one of your other books uh, all involves like the rise of Hitler in Germany or whatever. And uh, I guess I guess people say that the fact that the U.S. didn't join the League of Nations, maybe that had something to do. Do you think that would have had any effect on the course of events and, you know, the buildup to World War II or, or no? Actually, no. I mean, well, here's an interesting thing which doesn't get considered much. So Franklin Roosevelt had been this big um, Wilsonian. Hoover had been a Wilsonian, too. Uh, But 
Wilson has, uh, I mean, Roosevelt, Franklin has a big Democratic majority. There's never any move to, to get America back into the United Nations. There's no great desire on the American people to do that. Uh, America is becoming more and more isolationist in the 30s, even than it was, say, in the 20s. You have all these neutrality acts, uh, et cetera, et cetera. One of the key things when Roosevelt is running for president in 1936 is to give his speech. And, and international tensions are growing then, particularly with the Spanish Civil War. And he took, goes at Chautauqua and gives this speech about how I hate war. And which is kind of like the signal which he's which he's going to make in 1940. He's not going to send your boys in, into a foreign war. America doesn't want to be involved in these things, even if it was a member of the League of Nations. Was it going to then, you know, send troops into the Rhineland or the Ruhr or Austria or the Sudetenland to do anything about uh, about Germany? I would I would say no. The British and the and the French weren't doing it. They were members of the League of Nations. Germany goes into the League of Nations in the 20s, comes out uh, in the 30s. Russia joins. People, it's sort of like a revolving door of who's a member, who's coming and who's going. But it's just really a, a debating society. It really doesn't do much to stop, stop wars any more than the United Nations really has. The wars which, which occur you know, post-1945 occur and how much the United Nations has to do with stopping any other wars, I would say nothing. It's the face-to-face -face diplomacy between the great powers, i.e., say, the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, which are which are of more effect than whether, uh, you know, what Adlai Stevenson is saying on the floor of the United Nations later on. So one thing... Uh... It's always a little hard for me to get my head around when I read about the politics of this era is, you know, I'm used to today, all the conserv you know, the, all the conservatives favor the Republican Party and all the progressives favor the Democratic Party, more or less. And in, it, it seems like in this period, you don't really have that. It's kind of mix and match. It's not always easy to, to say what divides the, the two parties. So, I mean, like what? What divides the, you know, what's the difference between a Republican and a Democrat in the 1920s, say? Ha! Huh. <laughs> <laughs> Depends who you're talking to. And, you know, in the Republican Party, Harding and Coolidge are very conservative and would be as, as pretty much as defined by, shall we say, modern day post-war conservatism. Whereas then Theodore Roosevelt, you know, a big progressive, both small P progressive, large P progressive, forming a third party, guys like uh, Senators Bora and Hiram Johnson, a very liberal people in the Republican Party, Fiorella LaGuardia uh, at this point and throughout the 1930s, people who uh, today would be called uh, rhinos, okay? Um, so you've got them all chock-a-block in the Republican Party. And then in in the Democratic Party, okay, who's who's a member of that? Is, are there the the and well, it's an oversimplification to say that all the Southern Democrats are conservatives because they're not. You know, in the 1930s and 1920s, you're going to get Huey Long coming out of the South, and he's you know his economic pro, uh, program, share the wealth, not conservative by any means. Um, a fellow like Claude Pepper in the 30s, who was <laughs> who was so liberal, he was known as Claude Red Pepper, <laughs> Florida from a senator from Florida, um, and, and and the populists, the populists, uh, Tom Watson and people uh, like that in the South. So it's it's a mishmash of of people in the South, uh, and then you have the big city bosses, the the moderate progressives in in the Democratic Party like Woodrow Wilson, who doesn't start out like, like Franklin Roosevelt does not start out as a progressive, starts out as fairly conservative, very much opposed to the agrarian populists who make up the uh, another segment of the Democratic Party under William Jennings Bryan. The, the people in the East, whether they are Republicans or Democrats, can't stand the, the populism of, of, of William Jennings Bryan. 
they, they not only on substance, but they just think he's a complete horse's ass. Uh, so in, in many cases, the divide is geographic as much as um, as ideological. It, it's a mish, mishmash and, it, and it's a total patchwork of things. And it doesn't get sorted out. It doesn't even start to start to get sorted out until maybe the 1960s. Oh, Pete, did you say something? I, I couldn't hear you. I was actually testing my microphone. I think I finally oh. got everything sorted out okay, from 20. <laughs> I was just, yeah. So I was just going to say, uh, you know, one thing that I guess is like a big internal uh, part of division is the, the prohibition issue, the wets versus the dries. Yeah. The, uh, <sighs> that's interesting too because you'd say well the conservatives would be for prohibition and the progressives or the people on the left or the more liberals would be opposed and again that's not the case one of, one of the points i like to make in in my books is don't look for the same left right divide that you that that exists now so that many of the progressives are prohibitionists, like, again, Hiram Johnson and William E. Bora, the senators from the western part of the state, the Republican progressives are very much strong prohibitionists. And a guy like Harding and a guy like Coolidge, they could care less. They're really not prohibitionists. And particularly with Harding, you know, it's like, well, OK, this is what the voters want today. <laughs> uh, I'll vote for it, but that's I could I don't care, and that's one of, that's one of the problems with the failure of prohibition in the twenties is that the Republican administrations of that point are not interested in enforcing it. The the amount of money which is put into it is is very negligible, and it's only when Hoover starts <laughs> starts to do his sort of Wonder Boy act and try to figure out how to solve the problem of a law which is not everyone is in favor of and not too many people are breaching, then then the whole issue kind of blows up and gets raised to, okay, what, what are we going to do with this? Maybe we should, are we going to reform this? Are we going to change it? Are we going to abolish it, et cetera, et cetera? And the same process holds to a gr much greater extent with women's suffrage, where it's like, well, the Republicans aren't going to be for that. It's going to be the Democrats, right? Wrong. And that's because, um, in part because of the Democrats in the South being almost totally, almost, but not entirely, opposed to uh, women's suffrage. And in the big city machines for quite a while until the end when, when public opinion flips. And then they get back and, and oh, in the East, the East is very conservative. The West is is less, less less conservative. So it's the Western states which put women's suffrage in. As late as like 1915, there are three big referenda in the Eastern states on women's suffrage. Massachusetts, New York, and Pennsylvania. And they all go down like a rock in terms of women voting. And it is not until two years later when women's suffrage passes it pa passes in New York State, uh, and again when when the vote in New York City uh, flips, because previous to that the upstate vote had been for women's suffrage, and the vote in the city had been opposed. That you see the 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 signal to the rest of the country that the the train is leaving the station on women's suffrage, and sort of get on board politicians because if you get if you don't, uh, you're you're going to see uh, you know politicians' careers left in the dust, and a bunch of, of big name politicians, like a Senator John Weeks of Massachusetts, a Republican, and a, a Senator Salisbury of Delaware, who are targeted by the sub suffragettes, and when they go down, uh, it sends a signal to the other other guys: get on board. You don't want to be ex office holders you don't want to be ex united states senator there's there's one very interesting case later on 
of a, of a senator from New York uh, who is both anti-prohibition and anti-women suffrage. And he loses his seat in, in 1926 uh, and to Robert Wagner, in part because of, of, of the women's vote and because of his opposition to prohibition, which is really very unpopular in New York, and his, his opposition to women's suffrage. Why does he oppose both those issues? We have very consistent reasons. States' rights. States' rights. That the uh, prohibition administra uh, administration takes the power out of the hands of the states. And actually, so does the uh, national suffrage amendment. Something to consider. Uh, misconceptions about both amendments. One, women did have the right to vote, but not in every state. I mean, in most in, in state after state after state, they were being able to vote. It is when that uh, amendment passage passes in the August 1920 that it becomes nationwide and really gives the women the vote right to vote, mostly in, in the South, because those are, those are the states which are not allowing it at that point. And also, it's like, so prohibition means you can't drink. Prohibition means you can't have booze. Absolutely not. It talks about the manufacture, transportation, and sale of booze under most circumstances, not all, in terms of medicinal booze. I mean, you could still do that, and that was a, a loophole that was mightily, mightily abused. But with the, uh, uh, you could, uh, and, and the very wealthy, including Franklin Roosevelt, would stock up uh, with very uh, great wine cellars and uh, uh, to hopefully wait out how long uh, this amendment was going to uh, last. Um, so so a, a lot of uh, nuances to these amendments as to how they were passed and how they were enforced and, and what they actually meant. I'm yeah. curious. So one of the things we learn about as we do the show is all these different things kind of tie together. And we look at you know a two-party system that the parties evolve all the time. We often focus on presidents because we can remember their names, maybe. Uh, but I think it's a very senator. handy way to learn American history. Okay, it's but a great it, but, yeah. because if you try to yeah. if you try to learn the whole thing in one big bite, you're going to choke on it. So presidents right. enable you to take smaller bite-sized bites. But the people that have the real power are often not that president. I mean, we. Um, I mean, if you look at someone like Hoover. You couldn't pick a better person, better resume for president. You know, uh, we've done this a lot. George uh, George Bush, the elder, had a great resume for president. President Obama has essentially no resume for president. You know, right. and we have all these different outcomes. So it's really hard to know, like, what what the qualifications for a good president are. Do you do you have an idea? I mean. You could never elect a self-educated guy who grew up in a log cabin anymore. Like those days are probably gone. But what uh, what are the hallmarks of someone you think that are that are successful? Because we just we suck at picking this though, reliably. Well, political skills. I mean, administrative skills are one thing. You know, Hoover has all the administrative skills. He has like zero minus zero political skills. And then you have Franklin Roosevelt, who is, you know, creating all these rivalries within his administration. It's going to be Ickes versus Hopkins versus this guy versus that guy. And people are feuding. And then you take a look at who's leaving by the time of the third term and whatever. And all the changes he makes from what he's running on in 1932 and how the first New Deal is different from the second New Deal. And it looks like a ball of confusion, but yet, you know, four terms. Why? Because he, he has the political skills. He has the skills to communicate what he wants at any given point uh, and to reassure people, to reassure people, to, to create this persona of, you know, I'm on your side. I'm not someone to be afraid of. And if things are starting to go wrong or, you know, You've still got 17% unemployment in 1938. Trust me, it's get better. It'll get better. And also the skill of knowing who to run against. Hmm. And Franklin Roosevelt always has the has, uh, it's a great good fortune to as long as he's in to still be running against Hoover, Herbert Hoover 
and the depression of 1936 and against the media against the media there's a drumbeat in his uh once he's the president to run against the media just as we see in more recent terms and that's that's one of the great failures of well i don't want to get into the current current situations but i mean you know Political skills and being able to reassure people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, really are are key. That's 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 what you're in part elected by and what you're elected for. Do you think that's great? Oh, yeah. What's that? Yeah, I was going to ask. Um, do you think you know uh, politics back then seemed to be a lot more machine focused you know you had the candidates selected in the smoke filled room or whatever is that maybe a little under do we underrate that as like a method uh, of picking people versus what we have now well one of the one of the great mechanisms for vetting candidates and stopping front runners was the two-thirds rule the Democrats had, and the Republicans never did. And that plays a great role. It really starts to hamstring the Democrats in the 20th century, where Alton B. Parker is this great compromise candidate in 1904, and he goes down like a rock. And the same thing with um, John W. Davis in 1924, after 103 ballots at Madison Square Garden, and even Woodrow Wilson with, I think, 44 ballots in Baltimore. And he's ready to pull out at one point and just, you know, okay, I've, I've tried, I've failed, it's over. And his uh, future son-in-law says, no, 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 no. This is William Gibbs McAdoo, the former or future Treasury Secretary. No, no, stay in, stay in. It, it can still work. Um, but you know, it, it will knock out a lot of the front runners. And also the fact that you, uh, in the Republican Party, if you can't get the majority because of all the favorite sons, you know, you have all these favorite son candidacies and it's tough to run the boards as you now can uh, with Super Tuesday. Super Tuesday and, and that primary system seems to be the make or break. You sweep all of those, whether you're in the Republican or the Democrat party, and and you become almost, uh, have an insurmountable lead. I mean, that's what that's how Biden was able to, to pull it off last time out. And and that, that wasn't an unusual, an unusual circumstance at all. Another thing that fascinates me is throughout history, we have these uh, moments where we have these big fights, prohibition, uh, fe- you know, female suffrage, you know, these were only a hundred years ago, not even a big, not even that far back. You know, there's people that were alive that are still alive today. You know, that this, when this was happening, we, um, we struggle to get these things right, but we seem to look back in the rearview mirror. Like it was easy. It's often one or two people that flip or turn or do the vote and, and these big movements happen. So I think we're a little hard on ourselves these days because we don't realize how hard, how improbable a lot of these things were, I suppose. Is that, is that getting well, better? We're, we're hard on ourselves and we're hard on the people who sorted it out. Yeah. You know, we, we know, you know, we know what can play a hundred years in the future this way or that way. And, and we, we look with greater clarity back, maybe with greater clarity backwards, or maybe our vision is, is clouded by what we see today. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think I, I mean, you take a look at everything on, on social media and how everything is, no one can disagree. Nobody can say, you know, I disagree with your position or I believe what you're stating is incorrect. Everything now is you lied, okay? And 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 you should resign. And it's like, this this is not, this is not sound. This is not a sound way of, of governance or, or for society as a whole. It would be good to sort of step back and have a little politeness about things and a little understanding about people. It says in the it says in the Lord's Prayer, if I may unseparate church and state, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive others. And we're seeing none of that in today's politics. We also seem to struggle with the context of the time. I mean, uh, 
if you want to get into a conversation and have it lose its rationality, you start talking about the two thirds compromise. This is a political decision between the North and the South. And without that, there likely would be a completely different outcome in terms of, a, of what country or what countries exist in this space. Well, the, the two-thirds compromise, the word the word compromise is, is very significant there because it's like, I mean, if you if you concentrate on, well, you're saying the black man or the slave is only two-thirds of a human being, and that's the only thing you're getting out of that process, you're missing the point that if they are counted one for one in South Carolina or wherever, what you're doing is you're increasing the electoral power of the slave states. So by counting a slave as two thirds of the population of that of the of a person for the population of that state for the census and then for the House of Representatives, then you're weakening, you're weakening the uh, the power of the slave states. It's also interesting that after the Civil War, you would get you would get similar um, arguments by uh, proponents of black suffrage or of women's suffrage, and the arguments would run this way: take it down to zero. Don't put it down to two thirds. Take it down to zero. If black people can't vote in South Carolina, then don't count them in terms of how many representatives they're going to have or how many electoral votes. If women can't vote in, again, South Carolina or Georgia, then don't count them. And these are the women making the arguments. Don't count them and weaken their representation in the house weaken it in the in the house of representatives so you know all these all these issues are are very are more complex shall we say than if you're if you want to throw bombs at at the dead you know i wanted to ask, yeah yeah so i wanted to ask about um you know what your your perspective on like the relevance of history right uh, I remember I was I recently I was reading a book about uh, Alaric the Goth, right? Oh, okay. okay. So very very old, outside your time. But you know, in the first page of this book, the author was comparing the situation of the Goths to family separations policy under Donald Trump. Like also, like everything was just about now, right? And so I wondered, like you know. Uh, is it like what do you think about the applicability of history to now and and uh it's kind of like an atten- tendency to read current controversies back in the past yeah um back back when i was doing baseball history you know some of the questions you would get <laughs> would be you know how do you compare babe ruth to hank aaron to barry bonds Okay, and people would say, "Well, in this day, you had the 154 game season, and then you had the night baseball versus day baseball, and then you had the um, integration of the game, and etc. Cetera, etc." Cetera. So you had all these changes, and I'd say, "All things being equal, all things are never equal." Okay. So you could you could pick out things which which presage what's going on now, but you know, keep in mind that that there are all these other variables that really make a one to one comparison of things not exactly perfect. And then you can go into what you're saying about about Hilaric the Goth. And, and the immigration policy uh, on the border today, which which simply make it laughable, and which um, you know the Rorschach or Shack test, where everything becomes about what's in your brain to begin with, and then you start you start putting these lessons onto the past where where they don't, where they don't. Uh, people are different today. 
uh, among each other. Uh, and people are different between today and 100 or 200 years ago. I mean, they just just are. And if you're not going to take all those things into consideration, you know, uh, <laughs> you're, you're in the wrong business. One of the guys that uh, we like to throw bombs at, we've dug him up a number of times. About once a year, we dig up Kennesaw Mountain Landis. And, and I'm not saying if he's a good guy or a bad guy, but yeah, his history evolves constantly. Yeah, he's, yeah. He, um, I've seen the, the the misinformation about him is is quite quite remarkable, and uh, it's like, well, because his name is Kennesaw Mountain Landis, he's a Southerner. No, <laughs> his father fought for the Confederacy. No, his father. fought fought against the Confederacy at Kennesaw, at the Battle of Kennesaw Mountain, okay? Um, they, they were Northerners. He was a, he was not a conservative. He was, he was again, a, a progressive. So, again, don't look for that, that straight line of, of where you think things are going to be. He was an old, he was a T.R. Bull Moose type of guy and uh, a big antitrust person, uh, very harsh on uh dissent during world war one and again okay so harsh on the in world war one uh a prohibitionist he's gonna be a conservative no he's he's a he's a he's a progressive and all the way through he couldn't stand calvin coolidge for example could not stand it um and when i was doing my biography of, of landis uh, the standard story was, and, and, and in large part, this was based on a story which Bill Veck uh, told in one of his books about being blocked when Veck wanted to integrate or, or to stock the entire team during World War II, the Philadelphia Phillies, who were, who were very bad uh, with players from the Negro Leagues, and um, how it was blocked by Landis. and. You, you can find no real proof of this, and the story makes no great sense. And I thought, well, I, I have to say in this book how Landis blocked the integration of the game, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I could not find it. And it's like, what do I do? Do I say, you know, do I just go with the standard apocryphal stuff, repeating what other authors have said? And the answer is no, I really shouldn't. And uh, a bunch of research came out afterwards from the Society for American Baseball Research backing up my position on this and just sort of letting the, the chips fall where they may. Uh, if something comes out later on in in the uh, uh, records, then then fine. But you know what it is, it is. When Landis is elected. Um, commissioner of baseball in the wake of the Black Sox scandal. Um, the black newspapers in Chicago are completely in his favor. They say this guy has always been fair to us, and we, we just think he's, he's great. You couldn't have picked someone better. So, you know, um, it's, a, it's a complex situation. Would he have um, who was who are he who was he blocking? Who was he blocking from integrating the game? Which owner? And the answer is, well, the only person he would have been blocking was Branch Rickey. And Branch Rickey was not about to move on integrating the game until after World War II. One, I don't think we would have it would have been, shall we say, politic to replace white ball players who are in the service with black ball players. I don't think that would have flown in that era. But also, and also this was a time when you had race riots in Detroit, and these were white race riots. So you have to be very careful about that. You had Franklin Roosevelt dispatching tanks into Detroit to preserve order. But Ricky, Ricky, Branch Ricky was not about to integrate the game until he moves to Brooklyn. 
because where was he previously? He was in St. Louis. St. Louis was the only ball uh, franchise, the only city in the major leagues that uh, had two teams that, which were uh, not only segregated in terms of on the field, they were segregated in the grandstand. So he has to wait until he goes out and becomes a uh, general manager in Brooklyn, which is, I think, arguably and true, the most liberal city at that point in, in Major League Baseball. So the time has to be right. And that doesn't occur until uh, Landis is actually dead. And I don't think Landis would have, would have done anything to block the uh, integration of the game then. Why do you why do you say that? Why wouldn't he have blocked it? What gives you that? I know you've I don't been in think, the because I, I don't think it how would he for first off, how would he have blocked it? On what grounds? And he's he's lawyerly in that regard. He doesn't particularly like many aspects of the farm system. So his power is again one of these things of a uh, oversimplification of, of history. His power is immense, more so than any other commissioner, but it's not overwhelming. He can lose, he can lose on issues like uh, night baseball or on, on, on the farm system. He's, he's not all powerful, and he's also very loyal. And he's also very political. I don't think he would have done anything to, uh, to block the, uh, uh, the game. There's nothing in his history which would, which would indicate that. I mean, you just can't find it. So do we, and, and when we do this, and we do this and we put all the blame on Maine, uh, we're absolving all the other folks. We're absolving all the people in, in, in the cities which really were putting out statements that basically, no, never, we're not going to do this. The original, the-, the original meeting under uh, Happy Chandler, uh, the successor to uh, Landis, is like everyone. Everyone is is opposed to uh, um, Branch Rickey, and one of the, one of the great people who is opposed is uh, is another Hall of Famer, uh, magnate owner Larry McPhail, owning uh, who was in charge of the Yankees at that point. Okay, I'm so curious. let me ask one one question yeah. real quick, and I'll go to sure. July next. Along these lines, we like to say today uh, we want to be on the right side of history. I don't think that you can pick what side you're on, and and if you even if your positions even remember. I mean, there's got to be all kinds of positions that are just sim- look. How many people can even talk about Cal- Calvin Coolidge for more than five minutes without you know running out of stuff to say? So, <laughs> are, we, are we able to pick which side? I mean, obviously Branch Rickey ends up on the right side of history, but he also was running a business, so we had to do it in a way that the business could. Oh, he's a, he's a business. Business. oh here's here's the business aspect. Here's mm-hmm. where again where where the issue gets complicated. Who's the bad guy? Who's the good guy? The biggest black owned business, largely black owned. There was one white owner in Kansas City. The biggest black owned business around 1945, 1946 are the Negro Leagues. OK, they got operations in all the you know major cities and, and they may own ballparks and all that. Or they may play. They may rent the major league ballparks, et cetera, et cetera. It's a big deal. And what is what is the real asset of a sports franchise? It's the contracts of the players. It's not the baseballs or the bats or what lease you've got on the ballpark. It's the players, okay? They're the ones who put fannies in the seats. When Branch Rickey integrates baseball, he respects none of those contracts. He doesn't pay the Negro League franchises a dime. The guy who I just said is maybe a bad guy because he makes up a story about integrating the Phillies is Bill Veck. When Bill Veck signs Negro league players, he buys the contracts from the franchises. So it's like, it's complicated. It's complicated. gang. And also, okay. So branch Rick, or 44, 45, 46, and he dies. And then there's integration. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, 1945, 
no integration, nothing. Not the armed services, not the District of Columbia, pretty much nothing. A lot of jobs handed out under the uh, Works Progress Administration, Public Works Administration to blacks, uh, often in in lower levels. Um, there is a switch in loyalty of the black voter in 1936. But in terms of social integration, nothing. And he begs off, begs off, begs off time again, even with uh, anti-lynching legislation in the late 30s, even to uh, Eleanor. Yeah. yeah. Good guy, bad guy. I'm going to talk about Calvin Coolidge for more than five minutes, I can. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then he's, uh, he's replaced right by, by uh, Truman. Uh, Truman, again, again, a complicated situation. Because Truman, well, Truman, Truman is outraged. There's a there's an uptick in in lynching and violence against blacks right after the war. OK. And in the South, there's a one there's one case, a couple of cases which are really ugly and. Truman, who may or may not, and probably very likely was briefly a member of the Ku Klux Klan, and you take a look at his personal writings, and and even in his memoirs, like in 1955, uh, you know, he says something like, "I have been accused of wanting social equality between the races, and this is not true." It's like, okay, <laughs> um, okay, we kind of ignore that. But in 1948, when he's up for re-election um, and when he is going to reinstitute the peacetime or institute really a, a, a real peacetime draft, um, the black community led by A. Philip Randolph uh, is saying basically, hell no, we won't go. We put up with this stuff in World War I and we put up with this stuff in World War II and there's an actual war, but we're not going to put up with this time. And there's a poll that says like 35% of the black young blacks are not going to register for the black uh, draft. And they, the blacks are threatening a march on Washington. Harry Truman does not want this in an election year. And he particularly doesn't want it in this election year because it's not just that he has to worry about the black vote staying home or the black vote switching over to Thomas E. Dewey who actually was pretty liberal on this issue. New York had the first anti-discrimination law, okay, under Dewey. So there's that. But the real thing he has to worry about is Henry Wallace. And Henry Wallace on the on the far left drawing over, over black votes and what this could mean in the North, in like New York City or California, Los Angeles, Illinois, states like that, or even now Detroit or or in Ohio, the swing states, the black vote becomes increasingly important in that year. So under that pressure, Truman is going to move to uh, integrate the armed services. But after the 1948 election, I'm I'm hard pressed to name what what he does in terms of, of carrying forward on that. Hmm. I'm curious when you look at the 1920 book and you have at these six guys, if you were going to map out what might happen, uh, TR and Ivy making it into the fight, you know, Wilson end up ending up stroked into the oblivion, basically, you know, and uh, Harding president for 10 minutes and then cool it, you know, you wouldn't have picked that path. And then FDR being the, the long term winner in terms of multiple, you know, administrations. No. And 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 FDR is not ready for prime time at that spot, you know. Um, Twelve years is a long time to be between spots on a national ticket, and those are twelve years of growth. Uh, you wouldn't have you you wouldn't pick him to get polio either, okay? Um, so uh, the polio is a big factor in his personal and political growth. He was probably gallivanting a bit too much around before that, but having to sit around and rest and reflect 
and also that you know kind of have people come to him more and more uh all all work in his favor so and of course it's not just in by in the 12 years it's it's eight years when he is elected as uh, sort of a substitute for Al Smith as governor of New York. And he wins very narrowly that year and Jeez. proceeds to hone his skills. He also gets those four years as governor of New York to, to practice things. Not that it's like a small stage to practice on, but you know, it's, it's not like he's going into the presidency cold on on any uh measure and he also puts that um he puts together a great political team with lewis mchenry howe who's been with him in 1920 a former newspaper man and then with jim farley who is this this great behind the scenes political guy from new york city not a tammany uh, democrat but also uh Flynn from the uh, Bronx, again, not Tammany, but a big, skillful political guy. So he has this team building and then he has the brain trust where which I think is, is really unique or not unique, but unprecedented in American politics, where he comes in with guys like Rexford Tugwell and Raymond Moley um, and, and people like that and who are able to craft. Uh, speech, you know, speech writing for the presidency was a fairly new thing. Harding is really the first guy to use it to any extent. Coolidge reverts to pretty much doing only his his own. But Roosevelt, Roosevelt is like a Hollywood studio. He's the man on the screen that you see. But behind him are all these, you know, guys cobbling together the sets and putting the costumes together and particularly writing the scripts. So as Hollywood has puts a whole bunch of screenwriters in the room to put a screenplay together, Roosevelt has the same thing with his screenwriting team or his speech writing team with guys like Ray Moley and Sam Rosenman and eventually uh, Robert Sherwood, uh, a Pulitzer Prize winner. Very talented guys. But then what he does is he doesn't just read the lines he puts his own spin and emphasis on it, and he works. He works on practicing his delivery so that when he goes on the radio or before a 100,000 people, a person crowd, uh, or before the newsreel, he's going to do it. He's going to do it well, and he's, he's going to be this great performer. And, of course, he's following a couple of guys who, who weren't great performers, Hoover and, and Coolidge. Uh, so he's like a breath of fresh air after, oh, nine years of, of, of less than, shall we say, riveting performers. Harding probably would have been a great performer uh, on the cameras and on the radio. And also, also uh, Wilson and TR. But those guys are preceding the radio, preceding the talk. Uh, preceding the newsreels, and and Roosevelt arrives at just the right time. Hoover had been offered spots on the radio, but with his usual political brilliance, he turned them down. You know, and, and maybe maybe he would have inspired the public a bit more, but I can't even doubt that. I'm curious. I have one more question, and then I'm going to let uh, Josiah ask the last question, but. I'm always fascinated by these moments in history where there's one last hurdle to beat and then the path clears out. And the example I often use is that when President Obama is state Senator Obama and he's going to run for Senate, Mike Dicka is considering a run himself. And obviously polls way better than Barack Obama. But Mike Dicka's like, why the hell would I want that job? And he doesn't go for it. So once he gets past Dicka, the road is a lot clearer because if Mike Dicka runs, he becomes senator we probably never see a president Obama. So what wasn't, some of those there, wasn't there a, a higher profile black woman who seemed to be in line, but then she got thrown off the ballot or something like that. That was, I believe that was that was for, for house house member. Oh, that's right. That was right. That's right. Yes, yes, yes. Again, history, like this, history is held on slender thread. Right. What else stands out in your mind? Are those times where like, 
if this guy had lived, if, uh, you know, whatever, if this back deal, backdoor deal had come through, gone the other way, we'd have a totally different outcome. Well, all of those things, if, if McKinley is in shop, if, if, the, right. if the security is a bit better, um, if, if McKinley's um, vice president, Garrett Hobart, doesn't die, um, right. if, if, if that streetcar, which goes crashing into TR's car in Pittsfield, Massachusetts in like 1903, doesn't kill a Secret Service man, but kills him, okay? Uh, is there's always you know this alternate history of what if what if what if what if or we can or save if, someone's or if, or if the judge McCammon from Oregon doesn't stand up and and like flummox everybody and instead of nominating Irvine Lenroot for vice president in 1923 um, nominates uh, Calvin Coolidge and the camp and the convention stampedes. You know, President Irvine Lenroot, really? Okay. Or if Bora doesn't turn down the vice presidency in 1920 because he's William A. E. Bora and is just the most obstreperous guy, period, and says, I don't want it, and then somehow slides into the vice presidency in 1928, has a very much more progressive Republican presidency and a more progressive presidency to deal with um uh with the depression yeah. or if al smith somehow beats hoover in 1928 and has the depression what happens then what happens then and and it then then it's the democrats are the depression party and the republicans are are the get us out get us back to work party Again, it's it's again. What if? What if? What if? What if? Never stop. Whose life did Robert Todd Lincoln save at the train station? I forget who he he grabbed somebody and pulled him back or something. Well, he didn't. I don't. He, he certainly didn't save Garfield, but he was he was there. And and oh. uh, John Hay was the uh, was Secretary of State for for McKinley. So you lo see a lot of those uh, uh, connections from one assassination to the other. Or what if Giuseppe Zangara? Uh, it's a little a couple inches taller and can get a clearer <laughs> shot off at FDR in yeah. January of 1933 instead of killing Mayor Cermak of Chicago. You know, well, how about the, you? President, 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 uh, President John Nance Garner? Yeah. Who knew? <laughs> or if TR had slightly less thick speech when that bullet hits him in the chest, you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was yeah. just doing a, a podcast on the uh, D-Day and what saved uh, Scotty's life from Star Trek. Okay, remember Scotty from Star Trek? Yeah. He was on the beach killing German snipers and a cigarette case saved his life when a bullet went through that. Otherwise, it would have killed him. So smoking is good for you on d <laughs> but nowhere else. Josiah, do you have a last yeah, so I, so you've done four of these election campaign books, uh, and I was just curious: is there if you were going to do another one? Are there are there years that are kind of lost the sound? Oh, can you not hear me anymore? Mm -hmm. uh -oh. I seem to have lost the sound, so I'm not going to answer yeah. the question I don't hear. <laughs> and I think I know what the question is, but I'm not going to answer it. <laughs> Very, um, very diplomatic. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, let me let me wrap this up. First off, fantastic. I appreciate it. Everybody should go get 1920. There's the link on the uh, page. If you're on the podcast side, go check out the show notes. It'll be in there. I'd love to have you back on. I'm going to start chewing through all the books. You've, you've got a super fan in me. I can't wait to just buy each one and just go through the whole thing. I love baseball. I love that era of history. And uh, I love that you've got all these things out there that, that break it down. And I love that stuff.